Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Infinite Leaders Live. Uh, my name is Lewis Keynes and our why, the purpose for what we're doing here is really simple, to be better educators and to be better humans. We want to support and encourage infinite learning so everybody, regardless of role, rank and responsibility, is willing to listen uh, and to learn from other people. Alan, I'm joined as ever by my mate Al. How are we doing Al, you alright? Yeah, great. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, really enjoyed the shows we've been doing over the last few weeks and I, I really hope the listeners have learned as much as I have. We will continue to, to focus on the things you don't get taught at university or any courses, real life lessons from real life people with real life experience. And as anybody who's sent us feedback knows, we're learning as we go along too. We're, we're certainly not experts. This is not our day job. So if you've got any feedback about how we can be better, please tell us. Equally, if you're enjoying what we're doing, please hit us a, a review. Um, we're on podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all others. We're on IGTV and YouTube. Please press subscribe if you like what you're hearing. And we're also at theinfinitelearners.com. So guys, listen, learn, and share with colleagues and friends. And as ever, Alan will introduce our guest and we'll get started. Yeah, really looking forward to this one today. And uh, get your pens and papers ready. There's going to be some absolute gems of wisdom today. Mick Baz Rathbone is a former professional footballer who's played 384 football league games for Birmingham, Blackburn, Preston and Halifax over an 18-year career. And after football, Baz studied to become a physiotherapist and became part of the Everton medical team during the David Moyes years. In 2011, he wrote a refreshing book called The Smell of Football, which highlights the pressures and anxieties faced by many young footballers, as well as telling his fantastic story of seminal moments in his life. Welcome to the show, Baz. And Tell us a little bit about why you wrote your first book. Oh, it's catharsis, isn't it? It's about <laughs> uh, putting all those deep, haunting feelings down, you know, that keep you awake at night even now, putting them on paper, sharing the experiences, sharing the love, um, helping people, I hope. I think when my book came well, I know when my book came out, a lot of people contacted me and said, that was me, I've been there, I was the same and that. It was really interesting when the book came out because a lot of people contacted me and said, I was like that, I suffered the same as you did. And then equally, a lot of people come on and said, not you, Baz. You were always the one laughing and joking and we looked at you on the ball, on the pitch, around the players and see you as being the most confident of all the players. So it was a kind of double-edged sword to the reaction. There's quite a reaction, which I suppose justified writing the book in the first place. Yeah, definitely. And it's a very, very different football autobiography. So just tell our listeners uh, the kind of topics that you cover in there. And, and you mentioned there that people were surprised about what was in it. What were people surprised about? They were surprised about uh, the honesty, I, I suppose. People thought, I was a liar. I don't know. I, th I think people think that football is the best job in the world. And there are great things about being a footballer. There are some drawbacks and certain types of people find it very difficult. Some find it less difficult. And the other side of football, the injuries, the worrying about future, the lack of school education, leaving school early, the pressure to perform, the pressure to play well, the absolute awfulness of losing and not playing well, the public criticism. I think that weighs a lot more heavily than people would think. People maybe feel that when a footballer doesn't play well, he just laughs it off, washes it off in the shower as it was, and goes home and closes the front door. And I think as we get more into the mental health aspect of football, I think people are now realising, no, it's not quite, it's not quite like that. And if you go on Twitter and say that um, Mick Rathbone was effing hopeless today, he's a disgrace. To, there was no Twitter in them days, thank God. I don't know, I would have survived that. I, well, I wouldn't have, that's for sure. But I don't think people realise what they're doing when they're saying those things and they're hurting things. And You may earn £100,000 a week, but you're still a human being. And that kind of criticism, I know, hurt me, hurt my teammates, hurt my family, hurt everybody's family. And even the players today who you feel are isolated, insulated from it, in their big house with the big cars, it's still the same. Still the same. Yeah, I... We've had a lot of guests on our show, Baz, talk about imposter syndrome and a, a lot of leaders suffer from this. And you talk about there where in football, it's very much seen as a bit of a weakness if, if, if you're scared or you're anxious or you don't want to play. Can you just tell us a little bit about your 
experiences at Birmingham where you were suffering with anxiety and, and, and what that manifested itself into then how, how did you get out of that state of mind or how did you try and improve that state of mind? I always thought I was a coward, but I don't think that now because I saw the great definition and they, it said that um, courage isn't the absence of fear, it's the overcoming of fear. And as much as I've overcome it over the last 40 odd years, I don't consider myself a coward now. I consider myself somebody who actually overcame quite a lot. Let me tell you where it all started. It started in 1975. I was 16 years of age. I went to a grammar school in Birmingham. I wanted to be a doctor. I was really clever. I was top of the top stream at the grammar school and I wanted to be a doctor. I love football. I love cross country. I loved athletics. I was really good at all those things. But there was no conveyor belt. There were no academies. So the dream of football was there, but it was only ever the dream. And it all took second place to your education and your cross countries and generally participating in all other sports. Then when you played for Birmingham schools, Warwickshire schools in those days, then at 15 and 16, the scouts would come, Mr. Rathbone, we'd like to sign your lad. Then the dream that was only ever a distant dream becomes a reality. So all this stress now from players of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, will I get kept, will I get kept? There was none of that. So then I went into Birmingham City, my hometown club. I walked to the training ground from my house and I joined there at 16 years of age. I hadn't been in a system. I hadn't been training three times a week since I was eight years of age. So in those early days, it was pure magic, pure magic to be paid all beats £16 a week to clean the players' boots, the players I had those pictures on the wall. I was a big Birmingham City fan. I walk in there on my first day and those heroes, the people off my wall, are there, they're chatting, they're playing. I'm actually on the same training pitch. The first year was magic, it was magical. It was probably the happiest time of my life. I was there, I was a all right, professional footballer, around £16 a week, playing well in the reserves, played in the England youth team. It was only the second year that things started to go wrong. And things only started to go wrong as I improved as a footballer and got in the first team. And I remember we had a, a, um, a League Cup game at Blackpool and the first team had, had a meeting and, and they came out and we were warming up the youth team on the side. And one of the first team players yelled to me, get your bucket and spade ready, Mick. I was Mick in them days. Get your bucket and spade ready, you're playing on Tuesday. They'd obviously had a meeting in the first team and the manager, was it Ralph Rams in them days, had said, I'm playing a couple of the young lads or, or I'm playing Mick Rathbone. So that was my first introduction. You're playing tomorrow at Blackpool. I shit myself. I absolutely shit myself. And I can't help, I couldn't help thinking at the time, I'm not sure this is the correct reaction, you know, for somebody who's dream. We all say the same words in uh, the interviews as a young player. All I want to do is play. My dream is to play in the first team. And I was now on, I'm playing tomorrow for Birmingham City at Bloomfield Road against Blackpool, who are two divisions below. Played terribly, poorly. When I played in the youth and reserves, I was really, really good. I seemed to be just so good at football. Just either thought I was quick, and I was just a really, really good player, England Youth International. But then you cross the line, and then you go into this new sphere where the enjoyment now, it's about results and that. And the 200 people who came to give you warm applause at the reserves and stuff, they're not really there now. There's, there's 20, 30, 40,000 people. And the gloves are off now. You're a man now and you're playing with the big boys and that. And it was just too much. It was too difficult. If you put in line as well, all of a sudden the players who were on my wall, my heroes and that, they're now on the training pitch. People I worshipped, people I could hardly speak to even at the training ground because they were such demigods to me. They're now saying, come on, quicker. Get the ball quicker. What are you doing? What are you playing at? So it was a very, very difficult situation. I played at Blackpool. We got beat. Shock result. I had a stink. I was at four for a couple of goals. I was only 17, though, so I kind of got away with it. Went back to the reserves. Started playing really, really well again in the reserves. Yeah, of course, the comfort zone. If you keep doing that, I'm telling you, you'll get back in the first team. So I got back in the first team. I was still only 17. Made my debut at White Hart Lane. Came on a sub. I'll never forget it. I was sitting in the dugout that night and it was about, I don't know, it seemed like it was about 100,000 people. There might have been 30,000 people on Tuesday night. We were losing 1-0. I 
and I was praying I didn't have to go on and I was counting back I learned this trick I can count backwards from 5,400 down to nothing I'm counting backwards with my eyes closed it was going well I was down to about 300 and in those days in the dugout you've got the manager the physio and the one sub not like today 10 members of staff and 10 subs you know if somebody gets injured mate you're up next so I was sitting there I got down to about 300 299 elephants 209 I might get away with this. I might not have to go on in front of all those people in that massive game, like for Birmingham. And then, incredibly, the left back, he was, he was playing in front of me. He got injured and he hobbled over. <laughs> I'm telling you, he hobbled over to the dugout and he launched my career with the famous words, my groin's gone, get that C-U-N-T on. So I looked to the left, little fat physio, looked to the right manager and I'm thinking, this one's for you, pal. <laughs> I got up, I warmed up my man. I don't know, I climbed out the dugout. My legs were like jelly, like Bambi. I kind of jogged, stumbled, hobbled to the end. And, and, and then you're on, I'm on. 30,000 on White Hart Lane, the league game. I've made my debut. Dream come true, woo, not quite. Anyway, there's only about 320 seconds to go. 319, 318 by the time I'd warmed up slowly. And I didn't really touch the ball and I kind of got away with it. I did all right, you know. So the lad's injured now. So I'm in the team for Saturday Newcastle away. And I played okay there. And then I, I can't remember. I played a couple of games and the adrenaline stroke, fear, terror got me through. I did okay. And people were saying actually quite, oh, he's only 17, he's going to be a decent player. But then as time goes on, your performance drops off. And I really started struggling. And I really started playing badly. And the, the crowd are into you. And they're giving you a stick and that. And I was terrified to play. And I was, it's really funny, I've got a really bad knee at the moment. And I was running at the training ground at Finch Farm today. And it's swollen, it's really hurting me. And I look down, I think, where were you when I needed you back in the 70s, bad knee? I never missed a game. I never used to wear my shin pad. I was praying for a broken leg. Never got injured. How unlucky can you get? So anyway, I'm playing in the team and my performance is going down pretty quickly. I'm getting loads of stick. People are phoning in, they're writing in, and I'm just getting awful, awful stick. At Birmingham, you get changed in the corner and you walk, you walk down the tunnel to the halfway line and then you emerge blinking into the sunlight. And I remember standing in that corner, waiting to go up there, out into the light of that. And I remember thinking to myself, I couldn't be more scared now if I was getting hanged. I honestly, I'm telling you, I could not be more scared now if I was getting hanged. And I walked out there and he walked out into the sunlight and ELO was a famous group and they're all blues fans and that Mr. Blue Sky was a song. Even now if I hear that song, like some kind of Pavlovian, I have to go and like kind of lie down and that like, you know. And then they named the team. And, and here on the pitch now, your blue boys, number one, Dave Latchford. Hey. Number two, Malcolm Page. Hey. Number three, Mick Rathbone. Boo. I was only 18 or 19. And you know the thing that really hurt the most? That was my public. But you know what the fans are like? You know what the fans are like? Listen, we pay our money. We'll boo if we want. I said, yeah, but you're my parents, for God's sake. So things got worse and worse and worse. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know you're going to make that mistake once I was really lucky, I was on the bench, I was 12th man, we played Leicester at home, and I was counting down from 5,400, we won in 1-0, and I got down to only about, about 110, the game was nearly over, and it kept going through my head, if you go on, you'll make a mistake, and they will score, if you go on, they will make a mistake, we will score, <laughs> anyway, I went on, and I made a mistake, and they scored, woo, self-fulfilling prophecies, and it was awful, and people phoned in at night. And people can't wait to tell you how shit you are. People are horrible. This was the time of the Muppet Show, right? And uh, I'd go into a pub by Birmingham Airport. I was only 18, 19. I'd go in for a, uh, a pint at night, and then my brother's friends would come in one by one, and that, like, you know. And they would delight in saying to me, Oh my God, you're getting slaughtered on the BRMB local phone. In. You're and then the next guy coming, oh, God, I've been sat in my car. Uh, they're killing you. They're killing you. And these guys are buzzing off it, like, you know. <laughs> so things were going horrifically, 
horrifically badly. I didn't want to play. And I developed quite a good trick because the team was struggling. Jim Smith was a manager by now. I think Alf Ramsey had gone. Um, I think Jim Smith had taken over. It's all kind of a blur. And they'd have meetings and that, they'd come out and that. And often they were a player short for the training. And they'd always want me and they'd look over to where the reserves were training and they'd always pull me in. So I developed a fantastic trick. I would take a ball and as they come out, I would kick it into the farmer's field and go down and lie by the sprouts. So when Jim Smith came out, he'd look over, where's Mick Rathbone? I can't see him and pull some other poor unsuspecting victim in. <laughs> so things, I'd now gone. I was a straight A student, a fantastic cross country runner, an 800 meter runner, East Birmingham schools champion, fantastic footballer, uh, England youth international. I can't play football now. I probably couldn't even run anymore. I'd completely gone. I wanted to get out as soon as I possibly could. Anything would do. Um, a cut broken leg, any kind of job. So, uh, it's, it's, when I look back, it's incredible that, this, that I couldn't play football. It's incredible the state I, I'd got myself into. And uh, I got back in the team and we played at Bolton. I had a stinker again. And then we had a meeting on the Monday. And uh, Jim Smith came in. And Jim Smith used to go mad at the players. Everybody did in those days. It was a managerial thing, like, you know. And he, and, and he got in. We're all sat there, me and a couple of young players. And I've not slept all night. I feel like death. I feel awful. Sad. Scared. Scared. Yeah, I'm not saying scared. I can't play football anymore. I'm a, I'm a, I've gone. I can't put it another way. I'm 19. I've gone. I've got nothing to offer. And Jim Smith said to Joe Gallagher, Joe Gallagher was the skipper. We love Joe. He's a really nice guy. And Jim Smith said, right, Joe's going to say a few words. So Joe gets up and he goes, you three young lads, you're all shit, you're this, you're that. And you, I'll never forget it. He goes, you, Mickey Rathbone, he says, you think you're great, but you're shit. Well, news for you, Joe, I, I think I'm shit and I am shit. No, he's, he went into the other couple of lads and then Jim Smith said, right, thanks, Joe, needed saying. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Joe sits down and then Jim Smith said, right, we've got... I don't know, Man U on Saturday. It was one of the massive teams. Got Man U at home, Saturday going to be a full house. He goes, I'm telling you now, you don't need to get your effing fingers out. This ain't good enough. And I'll tell you now, any of you CUNTs don't want to play, you better stand behind and tell me. Now, that's a throwaway rhetorical statement, not taken for literal interpretation. But I thought, right, you asked for this. So... <laughs> But I'm laughing. I shouldn't be laughing, but I'm laughing now. And I've told the story so many times. And people have been crying and saying, Baz, stop telling me. Stop, stop. So all the players got out. And I was sat there on my own. And Jim Smith said, what are you doing? I said, well, you know you said if you don't want to play, stay behind. I don't ever want to play football again. In fact, I've got a job lined up at Diner Rod. They clean the shit houses out. So that's how far I'd gone. I'd gone from being the brightest kid at the grammar school, doctor, orthopedic surgeon, anything, you want, the world's your oyster, great cross-country runner, brilliant footballer. I'd gone to a guy, just let me go and clean somebody's toilets out. That's how far down I had gone, I'm telling you. Jim Smith was okay. He said, look, he said, I know you're suffering. Go on for a week. He said, but don't quit. Try, I'll get you on loan somewhere. And he got me on loan at Birmingham and the rest is, at Blackman, sorry, and the rest was history. But you know what? <laughs> the, the environment is so harsh. It's so, nobody seems to care. And like, they don't, didn't they look at me and say, right, how is he now shit? I remember him at 16, England Youth International. We were saying, this guy's going to be some player. Now he's shit. What's happened? What, he can't suddenly be shit in three months' time. Something's happened. Why can't we say, look, he looks like he's shot. He looks like he's got no confidence. But the players didn't seem to care. And there was just harder and harder on him. That. And I'll tell you this story. Like, I, I can't even believe I'm telling this story. Like, so eventually, Alf Ram Ramsey was at the club. And he, he liked me at first. And then he gave up on me. He obviously realised I wasn't going to be the next Bobby Moore. And he left me out of the team. What a relief. And you know what? They put the team up on a Friday on a board and I couldn't bear to look because if you're in, it's sleepless night. And, and, and 
it's the worst experience of your life. It's, it's the people coming in your shit. It's giving the goal away. It's the groan when you give the bad pass. All them things are coming. And if you're not in the team, it's none of those things. And if you're in the reserves, Blues first team Arsenal at home. Reserves Arsenal away on Highbury. Stake on the way down. Lovely. No fans there. Enjoy your weekend. And I went to the thing. And I used to like look through my fingers like this. Look at the, the teams from the bottom down. I was out. Oh, my God. I was out. I weren't playing against Arsenal. I think it was at home. I didn't have to go out and play in front of 40,000 people. I weren't going to get booed. I wasn't going to give the ball away. I wasn't going to be fought at the goal. They weren't going to phone the phone in and say, I'm S-H-I-T. I wasn't going to get five in the people and slaughtered by the, the letters that go in. I was out. And I went into the dressing room. <laughs> oh, my God, the relief. It was like palpable like you know but then some of the first team players kind of sussed what was going on and they were saying like can't believe you've been left out and I was saying yeah but I've not been playing well and they were saying yeah but he never said a word he said I've never pulled you in he never explained anything to you he just left you out like that just dropped you don't stand for that and I was like well I haven't been playing no don't stand for it and the lads were all buzz. Mick, I was Mick, I went back to later when I went to Blackburn. Mick, we're telling, they're all nodding. You need to stand up for yourself now or you'll never get anywhere in football. I went, well, what you reckon? And then they went, what, what you, get in your car. <laughs> oh, the, the training ground is about eight miles from St Andrews, right by the airport. Get in your car, drive down to St Andrews and tell Sir Alf Ramsey you want to leave. And it's a joke, what he's done to you. I was thinking, well... I won't play, Mick, and they're all nodding. Get in your car, down to St Andrews, tell him you're not standing for this kind of treatment and you want away. Okay, if you're sure. <laughs> so, I don't, my mum's car, little clapped out, daft, very amatic. It was about 100 quid, like, you know. So, I got in the car, drove the six mile down to St Andrews, like, he sat in his office at our hours. I'll never forget, he's got a three piece suit on after. Great guy, a legend, obviously. God, I felt sorry for him having to work with pieces of shit like me, like, you know. Anyway, he sat reading a big newspaper, like, you know, he had his three-piece suit on. I knocked on the door, like, you know, and he, come, come. I guess that meant come in, in my language, like, you know, in those clips, eloquent British gentleman, quintessential terms, come. So I went in, he goes, yes, folds a paper. <laughs> I goes, I'm not standing, <laughs> God, I, what was I doing? I said, I'm not having it. I'm not standing for it. You can't treat me like that. You can't just leave me out and say nothing. I want to leave. I want away. It's too late. So he, he's, he's you know, like a kind of rotating chair. He's got his feet on the table. And he, he spins around and uh, puts a paper down and he leans forward and, oh, those clipped quintessential tones. He said, okay, he said. You can go, you can go, but who's going to sign you? You're effing shit. <laughs> Talk about in like a lion, out like a lamb. And, 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 oh, God. When I look back, it's just all bad experiences. It's all bad, all bad. And I was terrified of my mark in the people. In them days, it was only the Sunday people that gave you a mark. Every paper does it nowadays, so it's kind of watered it all down. But in them days, you're marking the people, the only paper doing the marks, your mark was, that, that was, you, everyone in the country judged you on that mark, that some guy drinking his pint trying to mark 22 is given like, you know, and I'll never forget it, it was <laughs> 10 out of this world, 9 uh, outstanding, 8 excellent, uh, 7 very good, no, sorry, 7 good, 6 average, five below average and in them days the papers got printed in fleet street and come on the train up to birmingham station and i couldn't sleep till i got my mark the next day i'd hear the paper boy coming down the gravel drive and the paper would go at six o'clock in the morning and i'd go down and you're feverishly flicking through and so and you'd see your five your heart would sink but at least you could sleep now like you know and you got to the stage where I couldn't even sleep. I couldn't wait till seven for the mark off the paper boy. So I'll get in my car 
And the papers had come to New Street Station about 2 a.m. People were coming out of the night, were pissed and that like. And I'm on the side of the station. The bundles are coming off and I'm buying a newspaper and getting my five there, like, you know. And the players knew how bad I was with that. And one of the players said to me one day, he said, have you heard what's happening next season? The grade in every player from 1 to 22? That's, I'm getting one. I'm getting one. <laughs> that cost me about four nights sleep before the player said, by the way, that was a joke. They're not doing that. So <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, I'm laughing about it now. It was hell. It was hell on earth. I'd have done anything to get out of that. Those kind of killing fields. And you know what? It weren't even anybody's fault. I've, I was with Howard at Kendall at Everton. I've seen Trevor Francis loads of times over the years. I've seen big Joe Gallagher. They're good guys and that. They weren't being bad. It was 90... It was hard school, tough school, dressing room banter. And 90% it was in me and being soft and wanting to please and wanting people to like me, I guess, on a personal basis and that. So all the things were in me, you know, oversensitive, I guess. And that's it. That spun me then up to Blackburn. And I got to Blackburn, it was so different because I played in the top, Blackburn in the second division, the next tier down. And I stayed in a hotel, a little kind of guest house, right by where I'm sat now. It's unbelievable how my life has been kind of touched by fate and these incredible coincidences. And I got into the hotel and I thought, I'm training tomorrow for Blackburn Rovers, whoever they may be like, you know. I'll go up the road for a pint. And I went to the little Westview pub, 200 yards of my house, now it's closed down. And I went in there, and there must have been some Rovers fans, and there was a local telegraph. This is 979. There's a picture of me in the back, and Rovers welcome in, uh, Birmingham and England star, you know. So I had more currency because I'd played in the first division at 17, 18, and I was dropping division. I played for England. I went north with currency. I wasn't kind of the prophet hating in his own town. And it carried kudos. And people come up to me in the pub that night, got my autograph and stuff and had a pint with me. We had a game of snook and I went in the next day and I could tell the players at Blackburn were really friendly. But I came in not on the floor under the door. I came in high up because I was I played at a higher level. I was in the youth international. And that gave me such a boost socially in that dressing room to be more myself. The standing weren't quite as good. And there weren't 30,000 booing you. There's 10,000 booing you at Blackburn. So the whole thing was easy. And I overcame it and I got through it. And I rebuilt my career and met my wife. And you know what? How did I do it? Just by one. I built that wall a brick at a time. If you're building a wall, the bottom brick's a big brick and it takes some putting to place. But by the time you've and that bottom brick was my first game for Blackburn. I played well. And then the next brick's your next game. And yeah, I've done all right. Actually, I'm not shit. The fans are wrong. I'm not shit. I'm a good player. And then I started getting like good write-ups and oh, man of the match and that instead of being called terrible on the radio and in the papers the next day and all the people coming to the pub and that like, you know. So all of a sudden, my self-esteem was rising. But that kind of turnaround, it didn't happen overnight. And that wall of confidence, I think even now, 40 four years on i'm still probably putting the coping stones on top of it now and right. people will say to me like what, what i've worked for loads of different clubs now and when you go to a new club you have to sing <laughs> and everybody hates to sing it's the most terrifying thing and like i have to sing even though i'm 50 60 in the physio at forest and at wigan and at blackpool and with england and back with everton bars bars you've got to sing and that but it doesn't bother me anymore, like, you know. So I get up and I do the final rap scene from 8 Mile. And people do not accept, <laughs> expect that from a 60-year-old guy. And I'm telling the guys, I've got that to professional standard. So I go up. So I go up and I've got to sing, like, you know. And, pe and I say, you know what, guys? I say, I don't know any songs. Somebody shouts something and I'll do my best to sing it. So I say, pardon? Are you serious? The final rap battle from Eight Mile. I'm not 25, I'm 55, 60, like, you know. And I said, I'll tell you what, though, the manager, Mark Warburton, I to Cranker, they're always saying, do your best. So I'm going to do my best. I actually think I might have seen the film. And then I start off with it, and then obviously do the whole thing, bang it out. Like, so it is a great thing. <laughs>
And then when the first time I'd done it, I sat down and a couple of young players said to me, Baz, how on earth have you got to a level where that doesn't touch you? We've all been shitting our souls for the song since we signed Pro four months ago. I said, you know what? I said, I was scared. I was nervous. It wasn't, I wasn't nervous, but I don't care. I'm not a professional singer. I, I'm, I'm a physio, like, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You go, you sing, you're singing shit. I'm not a professional singer. So as you get older and you get more wins and more tick boxes and more man of the matches and more good experiences, they can abate those few bad experiences. So nothing really can touch you on that. And if I had gone up and sung, and instead of the standing ovation, that is, and people were putting it on YouTube saying, that was unbelievable. We weren't expecting that. And people saying, you're a shit singer. I don't care because I'm not even a singer. So it's just about learning to, I guess, fake it till you make it. And leaning back over 40 years and thinking, no, I played 384, 450 cup games. I am a good player. I know I'm a good player. I can live with a bad review or a bad performance and that. So that tortured, torturous 45-year journey of discovery, people say, how did you turn it round? Just by keeping going. I, I, I think, was it Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. And I just kept going. My wife helped me, obviously. And I just kept going and gradually believing in myself and get more confidence and, there's no kind of secret to it and that, you know, and when my book came out, I became the guru of confidence, a juxtaposition of having, and I'm now Mr. Confidence. And I started meeting footballers like-minded around the country. And, and really it's just containing it and sharing it and saying, yeah, I'm like it. I always give the players an out and I say to them, you don't need to be a footballer. I don't know how you're here today. It's not for everybody. It's not for many people. And if you're telling me you hate it, it's killing you, why don't you pack in, go to university, backpack around the world? And when you give people that option that there is an out, the in is not suddenly as bad because the in isn't trapping you anymore. And I met loads and loads of players and I say stuff like that. And I'll tell you a really funny story. I worked at Man U for two years on the back of the book as a kind of guru and mentor to the under-21s in those days. And I looked after the lads on loan. And I went back to watch one of our lads play for Birmingham City. This is now 40 years after I played so badly for Birmingham. So I go back, I've got my Man U tie and suit on, I'm in the director's lounge watching. Our lad on loan is playing in my number three shirt. He's having a stinker like I used to have. Unbelievable. At half time, I go in for a, a, a beer. I'm sitting having a drink, and there's four or five old blokes sat at a table. And one comes over and goes, Mickey Rathbone. I said, Bloody hell, mate, what a good spot. God. He said, We were just saying, bro, bro, Brummies, we were just saying what a good player you were. We should never have sold you. Terrific prospect and that. And I said to the guy, that's very kind. I'm the worst player Black, uh, Birmingham City have ever had. And he just shook, he laughed and went blurry and walked off like, you know. So the message to the players is, years on, the fans can't even remember that all those games are, are laid awake at night for Lou. All them games, nobody, they think I was a good player now. And when I work one-on-one -on -one with the players, that was the message. You think everybody, I, I take the Man United lads to the Trafford Centre. These lads, only a couple, and they say to me, Baz, can we meet? So we meet the Trafford Centre, confidential. And they were struggling with different aspects of football, mainly performance anxiety. And I'd say, right, I tell you what, and a lot of these lads had been in the first team in League Cup on the bench, as they do in them days, like, you know, the Nick Powell type era. You know, Nick wasn't one of them, but that, 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 that kind of generation, you know, Many of them are well household names now, you know. And I'd sit down and say, right, we're in the Trafford Centre in Manchester. I'll stop a hundred people now and I'll ask them who you are. And I'm telling you now, 99% of people won't have a clue. Do you know that only 2% of people in England, maybe less, go to games? But when you're playing bad and you're the hometown kid from Birmingham, you think they're jumping out everywhere and you're in the park with your dog, and you're in uh, Waitrose with your mom, and you're walking around, and you think people are 
all pointed and saying, that's a bit rough when you play for the Blues. He's shit. He's shit. you got five of the people. <laughs> Below average, it means, I believe. Like, you know, they're not even saying that. They don't even know who you are. They don't, people don't go to the games. 98% of people don't go to the games. 99% in the traffic centre don't even know who you are. So by torturously going through those years and those tick boxes and building that wall, the debut for Blackburn was a big block and I played really well at Wrexham, it was, and then I played well against Burnley and the blocks are going in and now the wall went up then over the next 30 years. Sometimes the wall was hard to go up and other times it flew up, but it got built and there's no issues now, you know, I don't worry about anything now. I join in in training sometimes and just give me the ball. And you know what? It's not that you don't care, but you understand it doesn't matter. I joined in a train lot at Man United and sometimes I give the ball away. And the, the good, they were, had some really good lads in them days like Tom Lawrence and Tyler Blackie and uh, Nick Powell, Adnan Yanese and Andres Pereira. And them lads, really good, you know, they'd be saying, Bass, come on, come on. I said, no, I don't care. Just give it simple. No, I'm not giving it simple. I will try a cross-field pass. And you know what? I'll give it away every time I get it. And you know what? If I do, take me out of the team then. You asked me to play. So, Nicky Bott was a coach. Nicky Bott were Warren Joyce. I said, no, I'll try the crossfield pass. I'll try my flamboyance. If I give it away, well, I'll give you the bid back. Them days are gone. <laughs> I left it a bit late, obviously. I was nearly 60 then. So, that's kind of my story, shortened into, I don't know, 20 minutes of torture. It's an absolutely phenomenal story. And, and there is a lot of laughter that comes from... From, from the story you're telling there because you're so entertaining as you tell it and we can, we can see and hear and smell that changing room as you talk about Joe Gallagher and the kind of abuse you're getting from the left back as he gets subbed and it's not because it's funny it's because of how ridiculous that seems in today's day and age that you could be spoken to in that way as a youngster and that was seen as normal and that was seen as completely acceptable you, you've touched upon it a little bit um about the kind of changes that you made. And, and I really like that analogy of you, you're almost building that wall brick by brick to get yourself back up. Um, what was your support system through that time? Who were the people that you reached out to? W was that important well, or was this something you went through on your own throughout that 20, 30 years? I went through on my own. Sadly, my dad had died when I was 17. My mom found it really, my mom was an amazing lady, but found it hard to know that people were saying, your son's rubbish, your son's rubbish, and that because they were blues fans and stuff like that. When I went to Blackburn, I played a lot better in it, so I didn't really need to, but my, my wife was fantastic. I met her when I was 20, we were married when we were 21. So perspective on life, I guess. And, you know, the distance of going 110 miles away from it as well, you know, uh, and being not in your own town. So when I played for Birmingham City, I know my chemistry teachers there. I know the kids from school are there. I know my uncles there, and I know my cousins are in the crowd and that, like, you know, and I'm almost, when that ball's rolling towards me, about to go over my foot, I know they're watching. It's that scrutiny of those friends and that. And when, then when you go away 110 miles, nobody knew me in Blackburn, like, you know. So it wasn't quite the same immediacy. It wasn't quite as personal, like all the pain and that, like, you know. And in a kind of, that helped me play better. So it was a kind of double-edged sword because I didn't have that kind of, personalisation at all, I could play better because I weren't worried if the fans didn't like me. And I was only here for a month anyway. I ended up staying for eight years, like, you know. But I've got to say, Man United was fantastic. I've done a lot of work with the England young teams and Everton as well. They're unbelievable now. You know, yeah, you know, you have to understand this is professional football and you've got to run, you've got to work back and you've got to understand you need to perform. So you have to have an element of that. And like, if you treat people for the Marines, it's no good saying, right, we was going to go into battle today, but there is a little bit of rain in the air, so we're going to battle tomorrow. You know, there is an element of, you need mental toughness to be a professional footballer, but there is a fine line. Everton do it brilliantly. Man United did it brilliantly too, and the England teams, we're only away for 10 days there. Everton do it fantastically well. There's a guy called Mike Dickinson I work closely with. I play a role in that as well, um, that kind of pastoral care, even though I'm the physio for the under 21, well, head of rehab's my title now, <laughs> uh, the academy. So, uh, and the other physio, Joe, we all engage in that pastoral role and we want to see the players succeed. 
And I've rewritten with my colleagues at Everson what success is. Success is having a fulfilling life. Success is not necessarily making your league debut for Everton. You know, that doesn't necessarily lead to happiness and that. In most cases, of course, it does. I'm not saying that you shouldn't strive for that. We try to, to, to return success. And success is doing your best, being a good person, being a giver in all walks of life and that, and going home and, and being a good person and being good with your family and you know, being good to other people, we kind of have re, try to rewrite that ideology because in professional sport, you know, winner, loser. And in the academy, if you want to term it as games you play in the Premier League, well, 99% of you lads are losers then. So we've done a real good job in, in rewriting it. And we emphasise now, and on you know, all the staff there, it's about commitment, it's about work rate. And if you go out of here at 16, 17, and end up working in... No, no disrespect to menial jobs. My dad had a menial job. You know, I'd be happy to do a menial job. Like you know, if that's where you end up, but you gave everything and you were generous and you tried your best, then to me you're a winner. So we've tried to re-categorise that, and they're, they're ever so good at Everton now. That awareness that you know what, it's the few of the few of the few that are going to play for Everton's first team. So let's enjoy it. Let's make it worthwhile. Let's strive. Let's be a good teammate. Let's learn good lessons for life. And I say Everton. Are, I would say world class at that care as a club anyway, you know, but particularly in the academy, they're, they're, there's nobody better than them. Yeah, I, I love that, Baz. And you, you allude to in, in your book about something that the Everton psychologist did with you, and you had to sort of speak about yourself in a hundred words or write it down. Would you mind if I just read that out? Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised oh. I didn't use more than a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read it out and then I would oh. want you to reflect upon the great leaders you've worked with. You've talked about the likes of Sir Alf Ramsey, Bob Saxton, Jim Smith, Howard Kendall, David Moyes. I could, we could go on, but I'm going to read this and then reflect upon, did those great leaders help you along this journey? So here it is. I consider myself to be a gentleman. I only treat people as I would want to be treated myself. I am sensitive, kind and generous. I care about people. I never lose my temper. My glass is always half full. Some people will possibly accuse me of being too nice. I have an outgoing personality, even though intrinsically I'm basically a bit shy. My motto for life is this. It's nice to be important, but it's much more important to be nice. Wow. Uh, well, I've lived my life like that, which is why I'm still working seven days a week at the age of 61. <laughs> You don't get very far, unfortunately. I believe in all those things. And in the very, I've worked with some great people. And the great people aren't always the people who've achieved so much. You know, leadership, to me, is a really soft touch. And when I was head of the medical department at Everton, I had five members of staff. I hope I led by example. I wouldn't go into the medical room and say, lads, you need to get this tidied up. I would go in and say, lads, we need to get tidied up, you know, and I will pick the first piece of paper up. I will do Christmas Day. I will make the final decision. If something goes wrong, I'll knock on Moise's door and get the hair dryer. So leadership isn't always the one with his chest out, thrusting and screaming up the front. It's a subtle touch. It's a more softer touch. I've met loads of people. I've learned a little bit from all of them. Howard Ken was a great example of just personality and humility and caring for other people within a very successful professional life and that, and knowing your names and your wife's names. And when I went to Manchester United on my very first day, I, I was going there as a kind of mentor. I was 56 then. And I had this kind of ephemeral role of mentor. And they said to me, Brian McClare said, Spend a year, find where you can fit in with the players and help them and that. And I wanted to be on the training pitch. And what a joy. So I played with the Preston, Nicky, but I said, Baz, get your boots on, come out. And I joined in the boxes and that and uh, joined in with the running and that. And as I was coming in, Sir Alex held the door open for me. And he was with the head of fitness, a guy called Dave Strug. He's a great, brilliant sports science guy. He held the door. He said, he, 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 oh, come on, come on, Mick. And you come like, you know, and Sir, Al Sir Alex said to me, I was just telling Strudders about your book, how you slaughter sports scientists 
which I don't, and we laughed about it. And then I thought to myself, oh my God, Sir Alex Ferguson has taken the time and trouble to thumb through my book and find out who is this guy who's coming in a million miles away from the first team down with the under 21s. And Alex Ferguson, my God, talk about the, 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 the velvet touch in that, you know, what is it, the velvet, in the velvet, the iron fist in the velvet glove. He surprised me so much. I was expecting some miserable Scottish bogger shouting everybody. <laughs> it could not have been anything more from the, that. It, he was an expert. He was well read. He was a great raconteur, but equally a great. People say to me, You talk a lot, Baz. Yeah, but I listen brilliantly well as well. When somebody's talking to me, I listen very well. Alex was a great listener. He could hold court or sit back quietly smiling at your stories. He knew every single, you know, that old, um, you know, that old, old happy old phrase, of, you know, is everybody's name. He knew everybody's name at that training ground, everybody's name. And that's a hundred odd people. And he would take time to go over. I mean, hey, how are you doing now? Hey, your pitches are looking well. I told you, you need to get your pitches better, you know, blah, blah, blah. People race horses down. And he'd have the banter and the crack. He knew everybody's name. He was a fantastic leader. And I knew he was a great leader because he'd won so many things. But I assumed he was very much uh, New Year and New Year and by the way, if you don't. And when you think about it, I don't think you can have sustained success like that. There's a lot of managers who go into a club, scream, shout, ball, terrify, win the next seven games, and then it all goes. When the ball, it's one bollocking too far, and you know what, yeah, I know you called me C-U-N-T, but you called me three weeks now, and you know what, the impact's completely gone. He surprised me most of all the people. What a lovely guy. Twice, twice I saw him walk through the dining room. Where's that so-and-so? He was coming for him. It wasn't me. Twice I saw the, you know, the, the, the iron fist, but it was mainly velvet glove, and it was very little stick. It was all colour. And it, it, he amazed me, I've got to say. And I say he, he knew about my book. He knew everybody's name. and He, he was unbelievable as a leader. Unbelievable. Would That's he have been the, the kind of guy that would have helped when you were playing? I, I think it, Jim Smith helped me, you know. Jim Smith helped me because I sat in that room on my own. Everybody got out training. And he went, what were what, what you effing doing? I said, well, you know, you said if you don't want to play, I don't want to play. I expected him to say, I expected him to go berserk. He said, you know what, Mickey? He said, go home, have a week at home. I get it. I feel your pain. But you know what? You're a real good player. You've got a future in the game. Go and have a week off and let's get you away on loan and that. Fast forward about, oh God, that was 1979. Fast forward 28 years. Me and the Everton first team are in um, Marbella, a training camp in Spain, Glenn Hoddle's training camp. And I'm running with a player called Joseph Yobo. We're doing some strides. They're allowed to train. It's a lovely day. It's January break and that like, you know. And somebody shouts, there he is. The guy I didn't want to play. I looked across. It was Jim Smith. Jim Smith, he was living over there. And I'd not seen him for like 25 years. And uh, he, he told the story to all the players. who were laughing their heads off like, but cheers, Jim. But I said, you know what, Jim? I never really thanked you for that. You know, you could have said, F off or get your boots on or that. You never did. You softened that, and you saw you saw me struggling that small period of time. Okay, the penny might took a while dropping, and you said, you know what, go and have a week at home with your mom. Don't give in for we'll get you a, a move somewhere. And then when I went to Blackburn, I was on loan for three months. I'd done, I'd done great. People were saying, what a player. I was getting man of the match. People were talking about, you know, me going to other clubs and back into the top division. You know, I was playing really well and stuff like, you know. And... They wanted me back at Birmingham because obviously I was only still 19 and that, you know, they wanted me back. Um, no, they wanted £40,000 for me, which is a hell of a lot of money for a 19-year-old in 1979. I thought, no way, I can't go back to Birmingham. I can't go back. And I phoned up Jim Smith, which I don't know if you do that now, phone the manager, you phone your agent, you know. I phoned up Jim Smith. Yeah, yeah. I said, Smith, oh, you're doing all right, yeah. I goes, please, please. No, they wanted £100,000. That was what it was. And that was just light years away from what Blackman could afford. I said, Jim, please, 
let me stay, I can't come back and that. And they dropped it down to 40. Uh, and I went and again, he'd done me a, a great service on that day. So he, he, I'm saying nobody helped, nobody helped, but Jim helped a little bit, you know, and coming up here helped me in a way. And the guys in the pub that first night who got my autograph helped and being introduced. I got introduced the next day and the, the guy, he's gone to Alan Birchill, who always does a tunnel at Leicester. He's a legend at Leicester. He was a player. And he goes, it's Mick Rathbone. We'll call him Basil after the actor. And that day, it was almost like Mick Rathbone kind of died that day and Baz Rathbone, confident winner, was born. It was really weird how that happened and that like, you know. So I've met loads of leaders and I guess I've been a leader myself. I've, I, 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 when I was a manager at Halifax, you're the leader. And people were saying like, you know, oh, Baz won't be a very good leader. He won't be a very good leader. He's too nice and he's too nice and that. And I was a manager at Halifax about 20 games, so I left holding the baby and that. And I managed in my style of caring about people, leading from the front, asking, not asking anybody to do what I wouldn't do myself, and understanding that as a player, you can play badly. And that doesn't make you a CUNC. I don't have to say to you, right, you got beat today. You're S you. I don't need to do that because I know that you guys who I cared about, I know you tried. You're not a very good football team and you're losing most of your games. But, you know, that kind of, predictable stuff in slam door c-u-n-t c-u-n-t you'll never play that's a load of rubbish and i'm not going to manage like that do you think do you think that you cared and you wanted to connect with the players like that because that was missing and, and you'd have appreciated that when you were younger you know how important that is Lou, to some of the players i've been there i've been there you at c-u-n-t you'll never play for me again or when i played my first reserve game i went up with the professionals it was crystal palace away it was a really hot day and we played at Salhurst Park and I was 16, my first reserve game, mainly senior pros. In them days, if you weren't in the first team, there was only one on the bench, so it weren't eight on the bench. So everyone, you're either in the 12 or you're down with the reses. So I got the ball and I passed back to the keeper, but the grass was long and thick and it went a bit short and they nearly scored. I thought, wow, a bit more on its second half. So I went in at half time and the manager went mad at me, effing and blinding about the back pass and that like. It scared me, it really scared me because when you play for school, boy, I play for Birmingham schools, Whitesha schools, the school teachers, they're not doing that to you. It's Corinthian, you know, you're not at a football club. You know, you're Birmingham schools and three cheers for Manchester schools. Hip, I was a captain. Hip, hip, hooray, it was all that kind of stuff like, not you, you'll never play for me again. So that was my first taste of it. And it's horrible. And he said to me, you go out in the second half and don't you do that again. Right. Am I A, more likely to do it or B, less likely to do it? Come on, more likely to do it because now I'm scared of making the mistake. So his intervention made me a worse player. And I've seen that so many times. Managers screaming at half time. If you do that again, you'll be off in five minutes. Well, they're coming off because they will do it again because now they're a bag of nerves. So I promised myself I wouldn't let these players down. Yeah, I'd have high demands of them, but I wouldn't let them down and that. And do you know the funny thing about it was? It didn't work out how we planned and that. But you know what? On that last day, I felt I was a winner and I felt the boys were the winner. We got to the last game, we run and we tackled and we did everything. We weren't good enough to stay up. That's not a disgrace. I saw us as winners on that last day. The funny thing was then about, about 10 years later, I was a physio at Preston, so this is like probably late 90s, 10 years on, eight years on. And we signed Chris Lachetti, who would be my skipper at Halifax. And when he came in, all the lads went, Chris, tell us what Baz was like as a manager. And Chris went, best manager I've played under, unbelievable. You got out of bed every day, you couldn't wait to get in there. You never screamed, you never shouted, you gave everything. Best manager I've ever played under, I rest my case. Yeah, I, I, no, I, shouting, I, no shouting, no screaming, no hating on people, you know, accepting that on our budget, we've got a relatively weak squad. We're going to find it hard to stay up and we've got nowhere to train and we've only got two training balls. And we sold our top scorer for 10 grand on deadline day. So to me, they were heroes. And I talk about in my book. I walked out of, out of there with my head held as a winner. I don't get anybody else says. So there you go. Yeah, just just 
coming towards the the end of our podcast, uh, Baz, and we have a few quick fire questions at the end. The stuff you're going on about is absolutely unbelievable, by the way. And, and just relating that about leadership, what's the one recommendation you would give to an aspiring leader? And it doesn't have to be in football; it could be in any walk of life. It's to care about the people you're leading. Yeah, honestly, you might think, "Oh, you see, you know, um, there's some absolute." Power corrupts, absolutely power corrupts, absolutely. And, you know, if you give a, a weak man too much power or whatever, if you give a small man too much power, they'll show you how small they really are. <laughs> I see all the time people promoted going in and then, like, not really having that subtle touch, that understanding that it is a sophisticated thing to be in charge and shouting at people. And Right, hang on, we were having a Starbucks yesterday. Yeah, I'm your boss now. I've seen a lot of clubs, I'm your boss, yeah, but he's your boss, yeah, but I'm his boss, I'm your boss, all that kind of echelon. When I went to Everton as a physio, it was the first time I'd had staff, three physios, a doctor, a master. I've got staff now, you know, and I, I, we were a democracy, me and the two physios, me and Matt and Danny's still there. Matt's the head of sports science at Man City's Academy, Danny's head of sports science and medicine at Everton. These are, you know, we worked as a three. And we go out sometimes and they say to anybody they met, oh, this is Baz, he's our boss. I say, guys, never introduce me as your boss. I'm your colleague. Yes, I, I'll make the final decisions and I'll get paid for that. But don't ever, ever introduce me as your boss. There's so many people want to be the boss. I'm the boss. Call me the boss. Hey, you call me boss. No, don't call me boss. You know, I'm Baz. I'm your colleague. I'll take the heavy load. I'll work the extra hours. I'll do the Christmas days and that like. I get paid for it. I'll make the final decisions. If something goes wrong, I'll take the blame. If you make a mistake, we've made a mistake. And I think it's that soft touch. And he's going in, in, in the medical room and it's, it, we've finished the little bits everywhere. And it's not me saying to Matt and Danny, you need to clear up, lads. It's we need to clear up and me picking up the first piece of paper. And it's, it's that to me is being the boss, leading from the front, but not with your sword out screaming and that. It's a sophisticated approach. I worked with Matt and Danny. We had eight amazing years at Everton together. We discussed everything. I'd say, what do you think? If I said, we're going to push that play, and they both went, Baz, I don't think that's wise. I wouldn't have done that. We had a perfect democracy. So you can be the boss, you can be the leader, you can be in charge, but you can still run the democracy as well. But it's about caring for people, isn't it? It's about wanting them to enjoy working. I, I'm a 99.9% .9 certain that any guy who's worked under me would say it was fantastic to work under him. And I think if you treat people well and that, you'll get the extra 1%. It's about going back in the office at a minute past five to take that phone call or, no, I've done for the day. It's those fine, those fine margins, isn't it? Like, you know, and that's yeah. how I've always done it. And I say, I've always in my life, I've tried to treat people like I would be treating myself. Yeah. Finito. That's it. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the empathy shines through, Baz. It really does. I normally ask about which three leaders in history you'd like to go out for a meal with, but I'm going to change it slightly for you. And I'm, I'm referring back to your book here. Which three of those people that give you loads of stick in the past and almost said the horrible things, would you like to now go back out with? And what would you say? Well, I, 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 didn't really, I wouldn't want to name them too harsh in that on here, but I've met them over the years and that. And... There's one guy in particular, he's a guy called Kenny Burns, who, he was a great player, he was European football, he played for Forest, won the European Cup. He was, he come from a tough, tough background. He was tough, and he was tough on himself, tough on this, on everybody. And as I've got older, I realise, you know, you are the sum total of your life experiences. And he was a tough guy, and he was tough on me, he was tough on the young players, he was a, he was a top player. He, he went to Forest, and he inadvertently made my life difficult and lack of enjoyment at Birmingham City. Now, most of that's down to me being, being weak and sensitive. He didn't come in in the morning and say, well, I'm going to ruin his life. He didn't do that. But he was tough from a tough score in a tough environment, in a tough era. And he was tough on me. And he made my experience at Birmingham really unpleasant, as did many of the other players, not on purpose. I saw him... 30 years later, Everton played at Forest in a pre-season friendly. And Kenny, who put a load of weight on, he'd finished playing at Forest many, many years earlier. 
but he was like the meter and greeter. And I went in and he said to me, how are you, Mickey Rath? How you doing, man? I followed your career, you've done well at Blackburn and that like. He was nice as pie, he was lovely, as was Joe Gallagher. So I've got to be careful what I say. They aren't bad guys. They didn't come in to make my life a misery. It was of that time, it was of that environment. And I'm sure 20 years earlier, it was harsher environment. And 100 years earlier, when 12-year-olds were going down the pit, it was a much more harsh environment. So I'm taking most of the blame and responsibility. It was a tough school and there were tough guys. And Kenny was from the Gorbals of Glasgow and that, you know, and what you see is what you get. I met him later on. He was fantastic. I met Trevor Francis loads of times over the years. He'll come over straight away. How are you, Mickey? And that, like, you know, and he's a good guy and that. It was mainly the perception in me. And I said, I've met the lads since and they're not bad people. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Lewis, do you want to finish up? I will, yeah. Baz, we... um... Our podcast called Infinite Leaders Live and, and we have a website called Infinite Learners because we know that learning and leading are so closely related. What, what does the phrase infinite learning mean to you? How do you interpret that phrase? When I was a physio, I was really old fashioned because I was born in 1958. But as I came through and I saw the new stuff in, I saw the dinosaurs of my era dying out and complaining and stuff. And I decided then that to be a better person, a better colleague, friend, leader, head of department, you have to change, you have to adapt. When I was a young physio, I, not deliberately, I was in charge of everything at Everton. Fitness coaches were coming in and I didn't really give them a second glance. I was a good guy to them, I was a friend to them and that, but I wouldn't let them work the injured players and I kind of slammed the door metaphorically in their faces. I've seen those two guys since, and I've apologised profusely because I didn't show them enough respect. And as I've got older, I've embraced all the new things. I now go out running with injured players with a watch and a heart rate monitor. People, when I first um, qualify, will look at players with a heart rate. And every day I speak to Jason, our brilliant sports science, and I'll say, Jason, I'm taking science out for his rehab. What you got for me? You say, look, Baz. 5k total, uh, 1,000 metres, high speed running, keep the sprints off today. I say, yeah, Jace. It's about respecting other people's positions and other people's jobs and that. And I think if you can keep going and keep working at a good level, keep your humility, I think, oh God, I can't, I can't remember what it was. I was at the training ground yesterday and one of the young physios showed me, he showed me a squat, a drill on that light, you know, and I said, Matt, thank you very much. I'm 62 in three months' time. You taught me something today, and thank you very, very much. And the day you stop learning is the day you stop living, isn't it? I know it sounds a bit cliche, that. And for me, it's all about being better. You know, I'm 61 now, but can I be better? Is there anything I can do that's better in that light? You know, can I be the best I can be? And that's all we say to the players. We don't use the failure word. We don't equate success in league games, 20 league games, success, no league games, loser, failure. It's... My three kids, we brought them up to be the best they can be. Be the best, do your best. If it takes you to the president of America, great. If it takes you to washing up at the local calf, equally great. It works. My three lads, uh, three kids, my son and two daughters have been really, really successful in their fields. How every, everybody would term success. But I don't term it like that. My three kids are super successful because they're great kids. And as they grew up, we never had one second's trouble with any of them and they're all successful but this and people say to me god your kids are so successful i say yeah because they're great kids so it's about terming success as well and not being you know carried too much away with you know the, the kind of material side of success i know we're in we're sucked into that vacuum now of what you what watch what car people at the club keep saying to me i'd love to win the lottery i'd say if i won the lottery i'd give every penny to charity I mean, you know, some people are so poor, all they've got is money. Got that off a podcast. <laughs> some people are so poor, all they have is money. There you go. Brilliant. And people say, people say to me, "Oh, you must be loaded, Baz." I say, "I'm a millionaire. I've got my health." So that's it. Do you know what I think? The... You know, learn. Try and learn. Try and get some of them every single day. Try and be better. Try and learn. I was spraying all the dummies down today, helping the kit. I don't have to help the kit, man. I can go in and have a 
well, I can't have a cup of tea. There's no way to open at the training ground. I stay out and all the staff stay out. We spray this stuff and we help him and that. We put all the stuff away because we're a team. Yeah, I'm head of rehab. David Unsworth is head of coaching at the academy. He's under 23 kit man. But we're a team and we work together. And we don't go home until his work's done. And I think it's that sharing of the load and being part of the team. And it's people, I don't want to say lower, lower down, but you know, with, with, I guess, less high profile jobs. When they see that, and, and when your staff see that you do all the international breaks, but I'll do all the international breaks, you can have a break. I'll do every Christmas day, you'll be off, and I'll do every Easter Sunday. Automatically, you're going to get more out of those people, aren't you? So I, I think it's sharing, and, and I, I think it's being, being a good person. And yeah, I might not be the best physio in the world, you know, and I might not know all the latest stuff and that, like, you know, but I, I'll always work hard, I'll always be honest as well. And I'll always give everything I can to other people. And if you're Wayne Rooney, I'll give you 100%. But if you're under 15, get released, I'll give you 100% as well. And that's how I've always tried to work. I mean, you can't say fairer than that. Baz, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to talk to you and, and to listen to those stories and to your views on things. Thanks so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed it. And if you can help one person... <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Then it's worked. <laughs> yeah. Top man. Guys, search really enjoyed it. Thank you. What a guy. Thank Top man. Guys, search Infinite Leaders Live on YouTube and IGTV. Um, if you can, please leave us a review and press subscribe if you've enjoyed today's episode. Uh, we're also on podcast platforms and at theinfinitelearners.com. Um, the world needs more leaders and humans like Baz Rathbone. And I, I've thoroughly enjoyed that last hour, Baz. So again, a really Great. sincere well, thank, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. Cheers, mate. See you later. Bye-bye.